Yeah, for Incubation today, we have Grace Rachmani joining us. Grace has her mind in many various projects in the space, recently spearheading a DAO leadership course and working on Priceless DAO. She's written ICO white papers, has a wide-ranging blog on sites like Medium and Mirror, and videos on Odyssey. I see her on various podcasts and spaces and joining in on all sorts of conversations. And I believe she just came from a Twitter space about DAOs and economic empowerment. Grace, yeah. glad to have you here. Yeah, that's me. So this is going to be like a big turnaround. Usually people, um, I, I come to spaces and I ask questions that people wish that I hadn't asked. So now you're going to ask me questions. So that'll be good. Um, yeah, and I've been working on some some interesting projects. Some about like what, you know, what would be, what would the internet look like um, if it were managed by the people? Like, how would that look? You know, how would you know, content moderation is a really big question. Like, how do you do that properly? And how would a DAO do that? And so yeah, I'm involved in a lot of really interesting projects looking at kind of these deep questions and uh, very interested in what you guys are up to because I think uh, AI safety is really important. And uh, in that evolving field, it's really, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I hope you're muted, Fly. Great, thank you. Uh, we have some questions uh, on this Myro board, so perhaps we can um, jump straight in. Some of these questions may be a bit uh, fluffy or high level, but please uh, take what you will from them, Grace. And um... Well, I don't see the board, but maybe it's better if you surprise me. Because, yeah, because uh, because it, it was the link was obviously shared before I showed up. So. Uh huh. Yeah, I'll yeah. share again for you. But I do have a I do have a Miro disability. It is now. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, Cran, would you like to pick the first question? Yeah, something we've been thinking about a bit is how to scale teams because we kind of started as. I'd say a smaller group overall, and we're starting to get to a point where we want to bring more people in for topics, conversation, making decisions. So yeah, maybe like how to scale teams from, you know, something like 10 upwards, 20, 50, and so on. If you've found any like pros and cons or have any ideas around that, it'd be great to talk about. Yeah, so it's pretty well known in organizational theory that beyond a certain number, your team gets less and less efficient. And so you have to break down the goals. It's like, okay, what is the goal of the team? And um, one of the things that DAOs don't have very good job, do good job of is, is, is the accountability. But if you're using something like Wonderverse, that can help. I don't know if you've seen the Wonderverse platform. It's a little closer to like Jira or Monday.com or if you're using a Trello board, you know, somewhere where you can really see what what needs to get done and who's doing it. And I think that that's, you know, that's a really important part of it is having, you know, accountability. Um, if teams are getting big, the question is, is it because the tasks are getting big or like, why are the teams getting bigger? Why, why do you want to be bigger? Is also a question you could ask, like, what's, 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 the, what's all the bigness about? Yeah, it's a good question because the ambassador program right now um, receives some a percentage of phase two funding from the Singularity Net Foundation, and really they've given it the ability to kind of move on, make its own decisions. Like there's not much oversight. There's been a lot of experimentation. Mm -hmm. Like we use a platform called Dwork, which looks like it's probably pretty similar in ways to Wonderverse and project management where, yeah, you kind of have a Trello type board. Um, so yeah, it's something that we have been trying to hammer out is like, what would be the overall purpose of the ambassador program in the ecosystem? They're working on Syncom DAO, which is, would be uh, the overall DAO for the SingularityNet ecosystem. 
So there are some people that are interested in governance. They lead governance work groups. They're trying to hammer out how to move forward with that. Some people are interested in education, um, as you mentioned, with like AI safety or even like classes on working with AI tools. So we kind of have a wide range of people that are interested in doing various things. And we're trying to see how the puzzle fits together. For, for instance, Fly and I, we really like this incubation group. We want to bring on people from the space, just kind of get some facts about their history, what what they've been through with, with DAOs, because right now it seems like nobody has really created like, you know, the perfect system for DAOs. It's it can be tough with making decisions and and voting and so on and so forth. So yeah, we're trying to just figure out how the puzzle fits together and if it's an ambassador program, you know, do do we want a lot of a lot of people in the, this program I, I would hope that you know as the community grows there's going to be people interested in the ecosystem to come along and help us out well what are you trying to accomplish like if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish then it really doesn't matter if you scale or don't scale like and it doesn't matter whether people do purposeful work is it has anybody read walk away have you read this book walk away I, no, I, think I, like a, I haven't. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's not, it, Corey Doctorow is, is not the best writer, but he's one of the best storytellers. And, um, and it's this, it's in this futuristic world where people like they want to do work because there's not enough work to go around. And if somebody does a crappy job of programming something or whatever, the next person just come by and fixes it. And it's just fine with everybody because there's just not enough work for everybody. So if everything gets done twice, it's cool. And if that's, you know, if you're like, we've got a budget and we should spend it, then it really doesn't matter, like, what tasks get done and how you delegate. And that kind of would, I'd love that for to be the future of work, where the AI does all the real work for us and we don't have to do anything. But honestly, it, it would be smart to set a goal. And I think one of the big things is, is, is AI ethics should really be one of the focuses here. And keeping the singularity net and the singularity DAO. And also, you might think, our purpose is to populate the singularity net DAO once it's out. And so that might, you know, so what does that mean? And that might mean what we are is a training organization that trains people in AI ethics. And, and so, yeah, we always want to grow. Do you get paid for learning something? I don't know. But, and then you might have outcomes. It might be very easy to test outcomes. You might not need to care what your teams even look like, because if you're a training DAO, it's just like, well, if you came in this week, you're in cohort five and cohort five goes through the self-guided learning journey. And every week you meet people who've gone through the learning journey with you. And then you take a test at the end and then you know if you succeeded, you don't even have to have anybody manage the outcome because people will have a certification at the end that they qualified to be in your DAO. I mean, that might be just, just an idea, but it really depends on your purpose. It's hard to say, how do you scale if you don't know why you're scaling or that question well just to chime in a little bit on that and, and thanks for that um on the on the budget side of things uh, we do get an allocation um but if we don't spend it it rolls over so there's no um hard requirement to every month make sure to spend it all um so that gives some additional uh, space there in a way um at the same time also leaves room for well not spending it Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I I wonder about uh, in terms of the scaling of the ambassador program. One of the things we're kind of initially aware of is trying to avoid a plutocratic p pattern um, and try to avoid a kind of uh, um, premium ambassador above the the community members so perhaps uh could you talk about some of the kind of uh pitfalls of this governance like um common mistakes in this in this development mm -hmm. yeah i mean one of the things is right one of the things is if you have reputation as a um 
an additive process, like you earn more and more and more reputation, then you'll always disadvantage new people. But if you have reputation as a scale of one to 10 or levels like in a dojo, oh, you're, you know, you're a yellow belt, you're a red belt, you're a purple belt, you're a black belt, then you limit how high or low somebody can be. And so then you could become, if you show up for, and we don't have interoperable reputation, but you do have LinkedIn and other things like that. You can have ways of people earning reputation. So it might be, let's say you're an educational organization and I'm, I'm just going to use that because it's the easiest for now. And your purpose is to make sure that the people who've completed this course of work are really understand AI in a way that they could be useful members of the thing that that DAO when it comes out. Okay. Let's just say that that's the purpose. Um, Somebody could come in and you could say, look, if you're already got this and this on your resume, you start out as a level three and you have to take this test to prove you're at level three and then you're at level three, even though you just joined yesterday. So you could have ways of proving that you're a level three um, and you could have validations of that. And you could, again, NFTs or, you know, whatever meat based tokens, whatever you want to call those, you could have tokens that represent people's achievements, certificates, you could use self sovereign identity, verifiable credentials. If you had that something with the disco XYZ backpack, for example, or you could do an integration there and have particular NFTs that belong to somebody who's passed. And then, you know, and you'd have a top level, you know, the one token, one vote is always plutocracy. But if you say, look, there are five levels, that's it. And you could also have them colored. You could say, well, this person is a level five at communication skills, but they're only a level two at AI knowledge, right? And so you could have five categories. You know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend more than that, but five categories where you can have a rating from one to five or one to 10. And you decide what the determinant of that is. And then you're like, oh, Grace joins. And she's already got apparently a higher ranking, but in only in this specific, you know, in the knowledge about DAOs. Does does Grace know anything about AI? Well, we don't know. She know about AI ethics. She has to, you know. So you could give you could give that kind of thing where people either bring in their expertise or prove their expertise in some way. And so then you would have, well, let's say you had a decision that needed to be made in a particular area you could have weighted voting based on who's got a five in that area, not who's got more tokens. But you're always going to have politics. If you have more than two people, you have politics. You may have noticed. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, if I may, a small question on the assignment of these, these um, different levels per like uh, category. I, I quite like that approach. Um, but is that like is that like peer rated or or based on past achievements or is there any thoughts there? It dep again it depends on what you want and how you want to do it. Dojo is very clear, right? There, it's a hierarchical situation, but it's actually it's it's a meritocracy. It's not hierarchical based on who got voted in. It's hierarchical based on who showed that they are a master. And once you're a master, you're a master. You know, in your system, you could also go down in rank. Like, let's say Grace had an emotional outburst. It's happened. Well, we're going to down rank her a bit in her communication skills. Yeah. <laughs> it really just depends, you know, I think that, I think that one of the really interesting parts of DAOs would be transferable reputation that goes from DAO to DAO. And I think NFTs are a little bit too public, but that's what we've got for now. And if we're just experimenting, I mean, the problem is, right, how do you give somebody negative reputation? Like, oh, my God, that, this guy has done the course eight times and he's a numb nut and he hasn't passed the test. And, you know, we don't even want to spend any more time with him. And he's also kind of obnoxious. And, you know, like, how do you downrate people? That is important. It's one of the reasons that DAOs keep getting rugged. Yeah. Yeah, I really relate to that. Um, yeah. Funny, we have like, uh, we've ascended some community members as these uh, ambassadors, but we don't yet have uh, a way to kind of downgrade, as you say, or kind of even a kind of 
process uh, a role um, to actually be analyzing this. And I guess, yeah, it kind of makes me think of this ombudsman kind of role. And I wonder what your considerations are about how to facilitate an ombudsman role in uh, decentralized organizations that can actually look across these different individuals and kind of uh, analyze what's going on within the program. Oh, I, I call that the automated bear. Um, because the because the hollow chain there, um, community manager is named Bear. And he's the gatekeeper, or I don't know if he still is, but at the time he was. And we thought, what's going to happen when we scale? And how do we create an automated bear? Somebody who's, you know, a way of, of understanding from the chat channels who's out of line. And you can, right? I mean, Twitter toyed with it a while ago. Now you don't get this thing anymore that says, like, you know, your response seems a little bit blah, blah, blah. Are you sure you want to say that? Right? You can have, you can even have it tell them like, listen, dude, that's like, that's off, man. And maybe only the chat bot, because it had, it had moderated them and not let them post it. Maybe only that chat bot would know that this dude needs to be taken off the server. This, because no, no individual would know what an ass this person is because their things had been filtered, but after 10 times, the bot is like, I'm sorry, dude, you're out. Maybe it would be interesting, right? These are interesting AI challenges as well. And one of the things you guys could be doing as is asking these questions and saying, how would I automate this? How would I audit? What would the rules be? And there always has to be a counsel. Like you can appeal. You could be like, the guy could be like, look, I'm just joking. The thing doesn't have a damn sense of humor. And he could that then that person who is going to be kicked off could show the actual comment and a committee of people who had been selected in some random way or who were on jury duty at that time would look at this and be like oh yeah this guy's actually hysterically funny and the boss just doesn't get it and so you you have to have an appeals process but there a lot of that could be interestingly automated and um the really big problem is that one poisonous person can destroy a community when there isn't somebody with the anatomical structure to get rid of him, which is like, you know, spine or guts or balls or whatever you want to call that to say you're out. And time after time, you see people taking advantage of the system. Also, because it's not somebody's money, like it's not that and you're not a for profit organization. It's much easier to be nice and say, okay, your whatever that you handed in is good enough that it passes and we're just here to be nice to each other and give each other a little bit of funny money. You know, it's really hard if, if, if you're not purpose driven, but you do need, it's really hard to be an ombudsman. It's really hard to be that person who has to tell somebody that they're out and, um, you know, how do you set standards, right? People have these long community standards, but in the end of the day, it's somebody's judgment. And you'll hear story after story about, you know, some organization where somebody toxic shows up and nobody wants to vote them out like it's supposed to be a vote, but nobody wants to raise their hand in public about that. And they just come, everybody starts to come to less and less meetings. And it's like, and then finally somebody does confront them or the organization falls apart, right? That's really tough. Um, and so maybe it has to be a group of three people that rotates and it's their job, but then, you know, how many people are, you know, are going to do that? It's really hard to be the person. I, I, you know, I, I, over and over you see that. It's a, this is one of the big problems. It's like, how do you get, I think that's more, you know, the problem of giving negative rating is kind of harder than the problem of giving positive rating. I there are, I, yeah. I guess it's anonymous, but it's hard to kind of get the anonymous process in a way that feels inclusive. Well, maybe not. Like you could say that there is a process whereby, you know, there's a trial process whereby, you know, some anybody, you can anonymously say, we think so-and-so, it's time for so-and-so to leave. And if three people anonymously say that, 
then it goes to a council, which is, um, you know, which is in some way anonymous. You could do that. Yeah. Like the person who's getting thrown out doesn't know that they're getting, you know, they get randomly chosen and they're the people, if you have a good ranking system, you're like, it's going to be three people with a ranking of black belt that are going to be randomly chosen by this algorithm. You don't have to have your turn more than once a month or whatever. And when you're on the committee, you have to spend that 10 minutes looking at all of the people who should be thrown out. And all that person knows is that it was three black belts, right? People have to have this ranking or higher to be on that committee. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, I think you make a great point about uh, the type of organization and the kind of culture that that, uh, that comes out of not having a, a, a private company or a, being on the free market is this kind of kindness. Um, and it's something that I relate to um, when you're talking about kind of professionality and how how do we maintain professionality of the people contributing to the the program yeah yeah and even why if we're not for profit i had a i think i told you guys that i had somebody come to me with this this dow that they were talking to me about and it was basically it was a group of people on one of the islands off of Spain and every six months they would give them ten thousand dollars for whatever project they wanted and they sat around they would have to vote on it and very quickly after the first vote very quickly people said no we want to give it out in thousand dollar tranches not ten thousand dollars to the best project but we want to give a thousand it was euros euros to each of the best projects and what they really wanted to do was every six months just spread it around to six new people because community cohesion was more important than having the best artwork in the town square wow the community cohesion becomes more important than the outputs i think that's yeah profound um right. yeah Grandano, would you like to uh, rail off a, a question? Yeah, it, it all touches a lot on what we've been working on in strategy, which we do right after this incubation meeting. Uh, Head Elf's been tackling, you know, roles as well as, you know, last week we ideated on leadership and it is tough, like you said, because you almost need somebody that's you know, if everybody's putting in, I don't know, some people put in six hours, 10 hours, 15 hours, you almost need somebody that's almost more full time or some team of people that are higher time that are kind of around a little bit of everything. And they need to be incentivized. You know, if there's no incentivization to kind of call out bullshit, then you just look like an asshole without any incentive to do it. Right. So it's something we've been kind of grappling with is some sort of leadership team or round table that can kind of make some form of final decisions as well as kind of keep keep everything aligned or in check um so yeah it's been yeah kind of tough for us to to think about yeah and it's it, it and some of it is is vibe right like what vibe do you want Bless you. Bless you. Sorry, comes in three. Um, all right. So um, it, it really is, un, you know, it's, yeah, there, there aren't easy questions to, to easy answers. It, when, and, and you do have to kind of make some decisions for yourself and some things are, I, I, I think I told you about this organization that they decided that they were following people in the Slack, Slack channels and it was a development organization and um, it was an AI company actually. And they, and they were, and they decided that even if somebody had the best output in terms of the code that they wrote, if they weren't participating actively on the Slack channels above a certain threshold, that person would have to leave the country company, even if they were the best programmer, because they just decided, we want um, our company to have communication among the people, and that's not optional. 
Now, everybody was able to transparently see what their rating was, which is also interesting. Like if people have transparency of how many times they've been reported for being an ass, then it's an opportunity for improvement for those people, which is not a bad use of DAO. I mean, right now, we, this industry is the most, like, I have never seen, not, not in this organization specifically, but in some of the organizations in this industry, I have seen such complete immaturity because there's no corporate discipline around. And there's a lot of, and there is a lot of very positive, I would say, tolerance of people who are neurodivergent. I think that's important. Some of the most genius people are neurodivergent, but there aren't boundaries for those who aren't neurodivergent and are just jerks. And there aren't norms uh, that people at least try to fall into. And that would be a really interesting use of the DAO as well, is to help teach people more corporate norms for behavior and having it really clear to them, listen, you were yellow flagged. Um, and here is, again, another training program that we can do for you that is a training in communication. Um, it's really interesting. Franklin Covey has a really, they have online training like communications and leadership training for a corporate. And they have a large library of training programs. And the way that they do that is they do this 360 evaluation, like your, your peers evaluate you and say whether, you know, whatever. And instead of saying, listen, you're a jerk, nobody can get along with you and all of your employees hate you. What you get is a, it's a bell curve. And they're like, this is where you are on the bell curve in terms of communication. This is where you are on the bell curve, you know, and you see all your little bell curves. And therefore, we're going to recommend this workshop to you. So it never tells you right to your face that you're an ass. So those kinds of measures. And again, this is all stuff. I mean, I'm talking about this like it's not futuristic. It's not it, it does require a certain amount of AI, but it is you know, recommending to people and letting them self-improve, I think that is one of the potentials of these technology. And, and it's going to have to be a required technology for many DAOs. If people can just join any DAO and, you know, do a gig work and leave, they're going to have to be some norms and expectations of what corporate culture should look like in the future. And hopefully it won't be as, you know, poisonous as it is in many of the DAOs today. I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting, you know, use case. Like, okay, how do we, how do we create that kind of feedback so people know where they are on the, and of course, if you're, if you're in a dojo, you know, right? And part of being in the dojo is you're quiet and you bow to the teacher and you do the this and you show up on time and you take your shoes off and you wear this shirt and, you know, there's a lot of these norms. Um, that are great. They're great, really. Yeah, nice. Um, just want to pick up on uh, something that Grandano was saying um, in his question. And it's related to uh, the management or leadership, or I would say perhaps management, um, that in your experience, uh, with these, with organizations like the, the ambassador program, um, what's your experience when there is someone, uh, working for, or in the program full time, or there are kind of a few people working, um, in and around the kind of let's call them freelancers say it's a very unusual situation um but it also depends on what the person's role is so i'll give an example which is something it doesn't exactly sound like a DAO, but you hear me talking about this all the time i was in a synagogue that had no rabbi um i mean we did we hired a rabbi and um but, but he was really part-time. Actually, the synagogue was run by something like a DAO and people had committees and whatever like that. And um, you would be surprised at how many things there are that people can argue about in these things. But anyway, 
And the employee that we had was the secretary. And she ran the office. And the president of the synagogue was a volunteer. And the president gave the employee what to do. And so it wasn't really a position of power. It was coordinating all the stuff and right, like the email that you sent me to get me here and all that stuff was that was the person who was getting paid. And so that doesn't have to be a position of power because a lot of what you're talking about is administrative. So that was a very different position. Yeah. But if you hire, if you hire a leader or a CEO, I'm not sure that's what you want to do. You want the vision to be more visionary. Yeah, I, I very much agree with you. I consider that there are kind of a lot of a lot of ideas in the ambassador program and a kind of uh, splintering work groups and guilds that without some kind of overall role to kind of maintain cohesion and to do these administrative tasks between and kind of over and above for the program, then the there's a lot of information silos which are developing communication silos that um kind of are taking energy away from people want to do and one thing that i consider is that um over the last months it's been a lot of from mine and crandano's side kind of putting out fires or uh clearing up spills and i wonder if you have any considerations on like uh shifting um making space making time perhaps this also relates to the professionality uh of people and their kind of independence and tasks and how how that is coherent with the rest of the program I'm not sure I understand the problem well enough to answer that question. It was quite convoluted. Um, uh, I apologize for that. Maybe Crandano wants to take a few spicy words from what I said and, and make it into a nice summary as he always does. I actually I do. imagined something <laughs> when you spoke. Yeah, like a specific issue I mean, maybe it's not wasn't really an issue but like you talked about splintering and like I felt like the treasury discussions were like like dragged for months through all the work groups, and somehow I felt like why why isn't it just like trusted into one work group and assigned to specific people who introduced the program and and have the knowledge, and then it's coming from different directions um, of like resetting it and then that was okay. but then it started like rehashing that in all the spaces and that was like a bit it wasn't a bad thing it was like interesting that okay it's like it's, it is what happens in decentralized places and especially if you say it, you are in charge of your uh or your basically your your finances and you bring your idea into treasury to to get it signed off in a in a sense, but but yeah, like the issue there is or like how do you solve like if some topic or agenda is dragging on like for weeks? But because I felt like after third week everybody was talking. We don't really want to discuss this, but we need to get this done, and then we dragged another two weeks. Like, are are there some issues that you just cannot really encompass it into like a simplified form? Or, or are there some like strategies or, or some methods that could have actually maybe looked at it in a different perspective to, to get down to, to actual a result and, and to have that cohesion or alignment on, okay, let, let's move on with this framework to, to, to reward people with rewards. <laughs> well, so I think sociocracy definitely offers a lot I'm actually going through some formal sociocracy training, and I think it does offer a lot in terms of, um, you know, people, and, and specifically in this case, like, can you live with it, right? The votes aren't a majority rules vote. There, can everybody live with the proposal? 
And so they would have somebody who's responsible, who's the facilitator or leader of a group or of a topic. And that person listens to everybody's view, makes a proposal, and then there's a vote. And the vote is, can you live with it? And if everybody can live with it, that's the decision. And if there's any opposition, then they deal with whatever that opposition with. But it's like, can you live with it? Because a lot of arguments are not about the thing. It's about, first of all, people not feeling that they got heard. And, you know, and knowing that there's a better solution or, you know, their ego, right? Whereas if you can just say, look, can you live with it? Like we all voted that we can live with it. It's, it's, it we know it's not the ideal solution, but we nominated so-and-so the leader of that so that's one thing. KPIs are really important, you know, being really clear about what the outcomes are and being really clear about who is accountable and who delivers and who doesn't deliver. If you want to avoid that kind of stuff, there are people who are delivering outcomes in your organization and there are people who are doing fuck all. That's just how it is. I'm right now in a, I'm in a startup now um, and they had to strip down because they're their runway got too short and they said, we're only going to strip down. And they had a pretty big team. A lot of whom were people who were doing work and being trained by the more senior people. They got rid of all the, the low paid people and kept only the senior people who just get stuff done and get stuff done on time. And that's something you should be able to track. Again, when we're talking about certificates and whatever, did you get what you, did you say, do what you said? Is it tracked? You know, can we count on you? And those are important things. And um, there's this there's this story that I think Tony Robbins tells a story about Norman Schwarzkopf and and how um, they were all whatever they were going into the, this war in Iraq and their their job was to conquer the enemy and it was like everybody had to be in line with it and they were all these armies from different places and you know they, and one of the commanders comes in and he's like listen those your army has women in it and they don't cover their faces and it's a really problem. He's like, look, we all agree. The goal is to take over this land. You tell me what veils over their faces and women has to do with the goal. Otherwise you can leave now. <laughs> it's like, if you know what the goal is and what the KPI is and it, and like I said, it can be that everybody gets paid for being just for showing up. It can be that community cohesion is more important. I'm not saying that you should make it always, the goal doesn't always have to be getting stuff done. It could be making people feel happy. But without that, you're always going to be floundering around. It doesn't matter. You can change, like, it, it could be weekly or quarterly or monthly. It just has to be clear. And it could change. It could be like, this week is all about everybody gets paid fairly. And next week is all about, you know, we do a meritocracy experiment. And the third week, we, you know, again, if you're experimenting, you can kind of do what you want. Well, we do a, we do experiment there. Um, basically, the, the conversation that dragged on for, yeah, as, as Tavo pointed out, uh, multiple weeks, close to multiple months, I would almost say. Um, the current solution there is to shift towards a proposal-based approach where the whole uh, which in itself is also an experiment um, and not a final situation. So, yeah, no lack of experimentation, that's for sure. But... Yeah, but yeah, the, I would say if you look at the sociocracy model, it's very interesting the way that works. That is it good enough? The fun like, fact like... is that uh, even still, there has been uh, one, two one to one meetings where, even though a month of discussions, agreement and then it's like how is this actually working now is, am i doing it correctly and like it, it, it still requires this now explaining what we agreed on it's, it's, it's a... you guys aren't at the root of the problem in this particular case you haven't told me what it is but i promise you you're not at the root of the problem you guys are talking about what needs to be done you're not talking about the individual who is having struggle, whether that's an emotional struggle, whether it's an ego struggle, or whether it's an intellectual struggle, I don't know, but there's at least one individual in this situation. And that is the problem they, they've gone, they, they could have passed trauma, 
they could have, whatever it is. But it's at least one individual that is throwing a spanner in the works. It might be two or three, but that's the root of the problem. It's a communication problem. It's not a problem about the decision. Interesting. Uh, I promise you that that is the case. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. Um, something to think about uh, that. Although I do think that we do have a real problem with kind of coming to consensus and consent. Well, not so much consent, but consensus. And there's a kind of pattern, a culture where it shifts into a kind of duocracy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, because you have some problematic free riders or people who just like to hear themselves talk or I don't know what the problem is, but I promise you that this problem is, in, you know, it falls into the realm of human communication. What would you or, say? Yeah, please. Uh, what would you say are the steps uh, that you recommend for identifying these problems? I can see them from 10,000 miles away, as you can see. Like if you have a professional who knows how to deal with it, I don't even know what the problem is, but I can tell you, right? Yeah. If you have a professional facilitator, you know, that's what you need. If you have, it, it is one of those things, right? Like it's, we were just talking before about toxic culture and just having one person in there who's toxic. That's your situation right now. You've got somebody who's slowing things down, at least one person or a conflict between two or more people, which is slowing things down. And you need somebody who can get that on stock or some skills for that, training for that. I mean, that's what I think. What do you do when someone like that is very much integrated into a community? It's kind of, uh, let's say, difficult to challenge or remove sit down and you have it you have to, i mean that's difficult right but you know <laughs> you mean, can have an intervention you can sit down with the person and you can agree and it's like having it you know a drug intervention with your friend you sit down you know, listen we all know you've got an alcohol problem and we're here to, you know we're here to support you and keep you in the community but there's a problem that keeps recurring and this is how it looks. And you try to be as specific as possible. You say, uh, I had a situation where um, I was working with a, an executive and the executive had this way of getting frustrated and saying, I can't work with somebody who is like da, 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 when he was in that. And I said, that specific phrase, when you say that people think you're about to fire them and it really triggers their like absolute worst in people. And, you know, it's really specific. When you say this phrase, I mean, again, I'm a professional, I have, a hundred of these tricks in my things, but it's like you have to have an intervention. You have to be really specific. These are the incidents. This is the recurring thing that happens. We see it over and over again. Here's several occurrences of the pattern. And we think that, you know, you need to handle this on a personal level. Hopefully you'll have some recommendation, get a personal coach, go to this and this workshop but this needs to be handled. Oh, my, my book, by the way, has a whole bunch of exercises in it. I don't know if it has one for this specific thing, but it, 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 if you've read my book, there's this example, my daughter's like, I'm in your book, um, where we were watching the X Factor and this guy gets up and he can't sing for his beans. Like he really, he's off key. He just sucks ball. And, and of course, Simon says like, look, you really need to choose different professions. And he's, and, and anyway, this guy, he's like, you know, and the guy's like, my friends think I'm great. He's like, and Simon goes, you might need to think about who your friends are. Which, and then th at the end, you see it, it cuts to the guy walking away and his friends are like, that Simon guy is such a jerk. You're great. You're wonderful. <laughs> but that's, you know, what kind of friends do you want to be to this person? Yeah, that's very interesting. Do you ever find you are brought into organizations as a, as a kind of Simon Cow when there is a kind of culture which has a root problem in a kind of person or a specific thing that the kind of perhaps the writing is on the wall with 
uh, certain people. Do you ever find that you are brought into an organization to be to be that Simon Cow to just call it out so everyone else can kind of be friends and be like, oh, uh, I like that. It's not me saying that, essentially. I, I try to be a little more skillful for that than that <laughs> when I'm brought in. But yeah, I've been in a situation where I was brought in, um, you know, to handle, you know, we, we did a three day workshop. And, you know, the first day we put all this stuff on the bulletin board, like it was like, okay, what are the communications problems? You know, my, my partner and I, and he wrote down all these things. And, you know, as people were saying, oh, well, this is fun. And at some point the CEO gets up, he's like, I feel like everybody's blaming me for everything, you know? And, and, and my partner's incredibly skillful, you know, and he said, look, you're the boss. People always blame all the problems on the boss. And he's like, oh, right. But it really was him because he's, right. But it was, it, it was a longer process. And he did by the second day, he like turned a bunch of those things around. It's, it's a skill. It's a coaching skill. And usually, you know, and I've been brought in by people, like I said, the CEO who would lose his temper in meetings and saying, I can't work with people who are like this, or, you know, he brought me in to try and help. So it's very, it's a, it's a lot harder to do online, but there are exercises, you know, if I know what the problem is, I usually do a discovery process and I have specific exercises and, um, yeah, well, I, I actually, uh, yeah. No, I, I'm not sure if it's like fully applicable to our situation and um maybe that's the perfect thing be said by the person who it concerns that uh, i cannot speak about but um of course um in my mind the whole treasury discussion which took way too long it's not so much about um one person being toxic or, or blocking stuff but yeah maybe fly you can elaborate a bit if you if you feel that's like I would, we talk, I would talk i would take it offline and talk individually about it and see what I, you know i might be able to recommend some exercises for this whatever the particular thing is you know sometimes people are just wishy-washy sometimes they're nice sometimes they're whatever it is but i would take that offline this is too big a group to have that discussion oh, sure, I, sure. I think that's a really really good point grace and just uh just a return on your question peter uh, regarding treasury, I think that is something that came out of uh, strategy um, because I think that for me, it's in the mandate of Treasury Guild to develop that. But for some reason or other, I'm not throwing any blame, but it wasn't developed by Treasury to the extent that it needed to, to make community feel comfortable. So strategy and incubation had to kind of uh, hash out a framework, um, uh, which like to, to, to push an idea, which was then kind of developed into uh, something that can be used for the whole program. Um, yeah. And then like after this initiation by strategy and incubation, then uh, conversations happened within the other uh, each each guild, each meeting, in order to kind of work towards that goal. But I see that it was something needed, uh, something that needed to be put forward uh, strongly to to in order to be uh, developed. Yeah. Uh, and had to be facilitated uh, outside necessarily uh, treasury, which already kind of has, yeah, it had it had a very busy, but yeah. It's interesting I, I that guess. actually Chris already mentioned that the idea of that uh, the, the communication barrier. And I think there what was because from my perspective, what was the final outcome? What was already implemented by Treasury Guild, but it it wasn't like then. It means that nobody else understood that that's the thing that is the outcome, and it re required some different way of presenting or communicating that this is how it works. This is what is meant to be. And then we went through full cycle of experimenting a new treasury model. And now we came back to the original one. Hmm. But I do think that sociocracy, like using formal sociocracy process could like, even without, you know, it, but it does, you know, it, it sociocracy does require maturity and it does require people to give feedback to one another in a fairly public forum, which isn't for everybody. 
but I do think that using a formal sociocracy process for committees that are stuck or for everybody would not be a bad idea at all. And they have like online training that's like five sessions and you do it with a group of six people and you try it out and it's, you know, I've been doing it and it's, it's pretty good. Right? Yeah, we should really do that uh, maybe with the ambassadors group. Yeah, it's... yeah there's, a, there's a program called Sociocracy for All and they have these little films and you go through and it says, okay, stop now and do this exercise. And then, okay. Yeah, regarding that fly and gran also seeped into the Odin group the, uh, in Catalyst, which is uh, experimenting on social security 3.0. I previously, two years ago now, I think I was um, from a, a governance alive, I was taking social crisis 2.0, but I felt like it didn't really match the expectation of what I was building back then. But now it's, I, I see that this is very evolving quite fast. So even this 3.0 is like so much more models, so much more methods. And like, it, it feels like it's, it's evolving itself. So it, it, it is getting more dynamical to different situations. I also think that it just, I don't know, having formal process helps. I, I don't love it, but it does avoid some of the problems you're talking about. What else you got? Graham, would you like to fire away a question? Yeah, I was wondering as we're probably coming up on about 50 minutes or so, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to ask them or any insights or discussions. Like, uh, Head Elf's been really working out subjects around leadership and roles. And yeah, I think that's a really important thing that, that we need. We could also use, I wish we could clone people because we could use two of many people in the ambassador program. Uh, you know, a couple Tevos and Flies and Head Elves and Peters would be great, great to have. And uh, yeah, Fly for us has really been somebody that kind of calls things out. And that's something we were discussing last week as some sort of leadership role because you need a, there needs to be some sort of incentivization for people to to call things out um but yeah if anybody else has any other questions or anything they want to talk about i also think you guys do a really good job better job than most of calling things out like often the person who calls things out is very quickly ejected from the group and so I think you guys have a really, really mature attitude about it. It's It's been interesting because we get a percentage of these phase two funds and it, you know, the ambassador program has been active for a year and we really haven't touched a large percentage of the funds as we're trying to figure everything out. So it it is interesting in the sense you would, you would think if you just give a motley crew of random people on the internet, these funds, we would just totally vacuum them all up and actually the opposite has taken place back in March incubation really started because you know we noticed that there's people leading work groups and doing things but one of the hardest parts is like using d work to reward yourself if you're in charge of a guild or a work group um so yeah we we found it really difficult to have the conversation it's like well how much do I reward myself there is no history of how people have been rewarded in this program at the same time, we're getting these funds that are meant for the community. I don't want people to look back in history and be like, oh, these guys took advantage of it or something like that. So that's been a really hard problem. It's how to reward yourself and come up with a proper amount. And, you know, we're so, it's so easy to do things by hourly, but also you're kind of hoping like, oh, maybe we can get past like, not judging things by hours and judge by output, but then who judges those outputs and the problems just spiral out sometimes. It's impossible. The, the monetary system doesn't value what's valuable. It's a random, the number's random. And just giving a fixed thing for everybody is also, you know, like could work. I don't know. Chris has his hand up. Yeah, what you got, Chris? Yeah, hi, Grace. Nice to meet you. Um, 
Well, one of the things, um, you know, I've come across a number of different DAO structures in my time so far. Um, and one of the things that I think a lot of organizations of this nature struggle with is the costing applying, uh, being applied to governance proposals and governance voting. So, of course, the lower the cost, if there's any cost at all, would open the pool to a greater uh, involvement, interaction with the community. But then the risk is also of spamming, um, especially with proposals. So have you come across the ideal balance uh, with costing if there is any cost involved in submitting proposals or voting on governance in a DAO structure? The whole question is a really hard question, isn't it? You know, it's not easy, I know. right? Because it's like the big cost isn't submitting the proposal. The cost is campaigning. And it's really, really costly for people to do that. Kiss everybody's ass and prove you're going to do it. And I think the process is pretty screwed up to start with. It's not how things are done. It's really interesting. I'm in a, I'm, I'm working with a company right now and they have this DAO, which is a funding DAO, but they kind of have an oligarchy that votes at this point. And so they have some things they want to do. And so they go out and they look for suppliers, just like a normal company. They interview three suppliers, they choose one and they ask that one to propose to the DAO. That's what a normal company would do. Go out, find three suppliers, have the professionals in the company look at it and then have the DAO just ratify it. And so we've turned that on its head. Like it's a complete turning on the head to say, oh, anybody can propose anything, anything. I think, yeah, it's, it's such a non-intuitive, non-normal way of making decisions in organizations that I'm not even sure it's the right way to go about it. Yeah, it's yeah, tough. I mean, this... I've seen, oh, sorry. I've seen, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I've seen a number of DAOs crippled with spamming of proposals, especially when things are going south. You know, um, a lot of people have an idea of how to fix something. They'll submit a proposal. And of course, then time is then spent considering the proposal, voting the proposal, um, you know, and in that process, nothing's getting done. So there's no solution. There's no remedy being implemented. Um, so that's why I thought I'd ask the question while I had the opportunity to see if there's, yeah. if there's a balance to, to try and inhibit a spam, you know, but not, would, not alienate yeah. a community or access to, to governance. I mean, I think one of the questions would be, what would that ideal process look like, right? If I had a problem with my DAO, whatever the problem was, and I had done a good job of, you know, like first this problem, like we better define the problem properly because most of the time we, we, the first time we encounter a problem, we define it incorrectly, just like you guys were telling me before. And like, after you kept talking, I was like, okay, let's, let's get to the bottom of the problem. But let's say, you have, you know, so having, Again, this might go back to reputation. So it might be really interesting to say, okay, we start to identify a problem. You could use something like some kind of signaling, like polis or something, or, or, you know, word clouds, like this thing is coming up and we know it's a problem and it's got to be solved. And then we're going to take a committee of people who are the, whatever it is, five people who've got good rankings, you know, whatever that orange belt or above or whatever, they don't have to be, you know, black belts, but who really care about this thing. And we're good. The five of them are going to get a stipend, a specific amount of money, um, for defining the problem together. And then once they've defined the problem together, then, you know, we'll have an idea cloud and that's just the ideas that are floating around and we'll have a discussion and we'll start narrowing it down to the amount, you know, to the best ideas to solve the problem. And then maybe we either do another committee or we say three or four or, or we say anybody who wants can submit a proposal and we do ranked voting on the proposals instead of yes, no, we can say, okay, we've got the problem definition. Let's do ranked voting on anybody who puts in a proposal 
and you know you get bonus points you can say you get bonus points if it's you know a certain number of people got together and did it instead of just an individual submits it you could do it something like that yeah. ranked voting is interesting in that way it's like okay here's the problem submit your proposal you could have a hundred but you're going to know what the best ones are so those ones will float toward the top pretty quickly we do experiment with uh, graded voting and in deep funding uh, so not not we but as uh, ecosystem yeah yes. yeah it is interesting absolutely yeah because the the truth is that if you've done a really good problem definition you're going to get good solutions and if you've done a shit problem definition you're going to get bad solutions so that's where the juice is anyway well, honestly, uh, the definitions within deep funding are not not strictly defined. Um, I would say, like, there's a couple of pools with themes and broader ideas to either put services onto the platform or improve the platform. Wow, that's that's kind of the problem uh, setting there. <laughs> yeah, it is, of course. It's, it's, uh, and and you get kind of okay proposals and kind of okay development. Um, you know, how many of those developments from DeepDAO or something is like, wow, I've never seen any other project that does that. Mm. Wow, it's just a real breakthrough. Because you've got Read AI, no offense, Read AI, I know you're listening to me, but Read AI is not the first bot to do what Read AI is doing. It's like, that's not, it's, it's, and it does it well, I assume. I haven't looked at it, but it's not a new technology. So it's like kind of defined and kind of, and then you get good technology, not wow technology. It's, 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 it's like, um, oh, sorry, it's tough over here. Oh, I just said it's useful. <laughs> it's useful, but it's exactly aligned with the, with the grade of, because you could be using Otter, right? Like it's exactly aligned with the, the level at which your problem is defined. That's the level of solutions you're getting. It's not 100 percent alignment but it's going to be close that makes me wonder about the current situation just to pull it back uh, circle a little back to uh, topic wise to the to the treasury situation and we're, we now have the situation that all the work groups need to put in the proposal for their own funding uh, which is pretty much no definition at all it's like well you want to do something put a proposal Th that's that's the whole uh, scope let's say like the whole outline it's bonkers but <laughs> part of it is but you guys, this will not be the first time I've said this. You guys haven't figured out what you're up to. Well, we had just a fourth session today to refine requirements for the proposal. And we are, I feel like we're halfway there to <laughs> establish something. But it, it takes time. It just, it just cannot do it in like every week, one hour and, and put brains together. It, it, it just requires more weeks then if you do it in that way. If you maybe you're approaching doing, it wrong. I, yeah, maybe that is. Yeah. If you try to figure out what you're doing and like you get a bunch of people together and you're like, let's do something together. The chances that you're going to come up with something is pretty low. Oh, we are coming up with something. That's that's for sure okay. good. But I'm wondering, yeah, like maybe we should have started with already a process because technically I have a, a, a workshop that I've developed over years now that outlines every single detail you need in a proposal. But when I present it, it's just overwhelming because there's so much detail you could add to the proposal itself. And so how do we dumb it down? How do we make it as simple as possible? And then the and another thing, I don't know, is it is it an issue or like, um, I don't know, is it the right approach or not? But what I like to do is just to start again with the people you have in the room, like what you think would be the right approach and should we do this? And how, how do you approach that and kind of build it together? So in the long term, you have that feeling that we need it together. We've set up the process together instead of, hey, this is something what was postponed upon us.
because this group, this single entry, in my opinion, this doesn't go anywhere. So it, if it takes two months to set up a process, or if it takes one week in two years, it probably doesn't matter, but the experiences doing something together, setting up the process will probably be more interesting than, hey, we just picked up this process and we started using it. Yeah, I guess like with this, if I relate it back to the, like the treasury and uh, how we've kind of changed again the the allocations or how the how this allocation is structured, I do uh, think we have kind of reverted back to an old system, which me and Crandano were proposing something uh, else because we found like, for instance, during marketing. Uh, with marketing guild when we made open proposals of like here you can literally do anything there would be like no responses but actually with very specific tasks people were actually enabled to get involved so i do think relating this to this topic here that there with this experimentation there are learnings to be made even if we revert back to an old system um and i worry that these learnings aren't being um aren't being taken uh taken by us uh for building further um with these processes and just kind of like oh we tried it this way let's try it back this other way Well, for sure, it's good to be aware of that, but I would say that's a bit early to say since we're uh, in the first of three months, but yeah. Yeah, this is a uh, slightly presumptuous. Um, I, I totally understand that. It's not me necessarily speaking from an objective point of view. Um, well, it's also not me, uh, don't get me wrong. It's also not me saying it's a, it's a great system and it will work. That's not uh, what I'm saying, but. I think what's useful for you guys to think about is like, why does Singularity Net need you? And why shouldn't they just cut you off? And if you can't answer that question, then, you know, you're having a fun time, but they could cut you off and they will. They yeah. will. Not like, maybe they will. They will. You're absolutely right, Grace. And we're wrestling that right now. Uh, we, we've settled a lot of the leaves down to the ground level. Uh, we've come full circle, as Fly has said, and um, I think we know what we're doing. We're we're working, at least in my definition, and no one's argued with me yet. Uh, we're working towards building uh, the best ambassador program uh, in the ecosystem. I I've enjoyed listening um, to. I want to get. I want to. I want to Before ask you interrupt you, me. Is, before you interrupt in what me. Way? Yeah. It, please don't interrupt me. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to finish it. I was about to praise you. Yeah. And I hate getting interrupted when I'm about to praise somebody. So I've sat here and listened to you and you've made some sage comments. What I find interesting um, is this is not a DAO, which we've had that argument before. It is a uh, an attempt to be in a decentralized world. And I listened to you using the analogy of a dojo, which in my personal experience is the most centralized organization I belong to because the sensei controls everything and every movement. So the analogy, um, but what I put a note down is trying to avoid plutocratic and limit reps uh to like a black belt i like that and i like we've we've gotten with the treasury now we have the ability to reward work and we have the ability to assign um reputation and one of the things you said today was a blinding flash of the obvious for me is how do we not get away with too much reputation and how do we limit it and and that was very powerful very very powerful one of the issues that we're having here is as you said uh, a lot of the youngsters and i'm inter interpreting don't know corporate culture i'm old school i'm an old fart i was born before the internet i know corporate culture some of the young people who need to eat and make bills are afraid to ask for money 
they're timid. And we had a whole meeting back in April and we shook that up a little bit and we unclogged it. But there's still this onus on being judged if I ask for what I think I'm worth and I'm afraid of being judged, which uh, hopefully the, the couple of people that are doing that get over it and just ask for what they think they're worth. And then we'll discuss it and we'll come to consensus or consent or we'll vote it or whatever it is. But I think those guys know that they haven't been turned down for what they've asked for yet. And we're working towards getting away from a dollar valuation back to wampum. How good is the wampum you make? And what do you think it's worth? And, and Grace, I thank you for coming on. Your sage, your wisdom, your comments. I got so much out of this. And uh, it's good to recharge batteries once in a while. So thank you. I still have a question. What do you mean by best ambassador program? What, what would make it the best? Ah, that's the million dollar question. We're working on that in leadership and incubation. What is the definition of best? In a piece of artwork, what is best? When you sell something and you're a salesman, you know you're the best because you make the sale and they have a dollar leadership. When I was a chef, what made my food the best? When I was an acupuncturist, what made me the best acupuncturist? It, it was when I fucked up on some herbs and a guy that was paralyzed from the neck down got an erection. I knew I was the best, but it was through an error. So what is the best ambassador cadre in the ecosystem mean? And, and we're working on defining that, Grace. I would ask Singnet because they will cut you off if it's not best as far as what they're concerned. And it's not going to be the number of people, you know, and they're already kind of doing it. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on because I haven't been around for a couple of, a couple of weeks, but um, because exactly because of this, there's a lot of talk and not a lot of doing, and, and I'm just trying to keep up enough, but, but um, you know, this thing of uh, Jan deciding who he wants as his little advisors, Right. Like that's basically kind of firing you guys as the ambassador program in some ways. Like I'm just going to pick my people. I have to disagree with that personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the proposed structure of Syncom DAO, um, deep funding is separate from ambassador program. And yeah, I see that more as an addition as a, a governance group, um, that, that will allow deep funding to scale by interacting with um community more in a well focused way it's focus yeah. group is what they call it no, but yeah it's interesting yeah. to see it like, like that. i see it as like cherry picking the people at you know the people that are really doing the work and and it might be interesting like how do we you know the best ambassador program might be putting Jan in a position where he's like man there's like a hundred i don't know who to pick doesn't that, that always be mention... sorry. sorry chris that's... has his hand chris has his hand yeah, yeah please please, please. Oh, hi guys yeah thank you um another difficult question i'm sorry grace yeah <laughs> i do apologize um uh, another issue that i've come across in the past when it comes to DAOs is um what what they do or what they can do or what they're inhibited from doing when there's an active emergency in play so if I, if I provide some context, I, uh, my company has a partnership with, a, with an organization called Lossless. They've built um, a protocol that sits in front of smart contracts. It scans the entire network. Um, in this case, we use Ethereum as an example. It scans the, the entire network. And whenever it monitors, when it identifies fraudulent activity, usually from, let's say, a wallet that's previously been flagged for being involved in fraudulent activity, it can issue a live alert to that project, that application, um, or whatever. Um, and the intent is to give them time to act, whether it's pausing the contract, moving liquidity, that kind of thing. But in a DAO structure, 
this this can be problematic if not impossible because let's say there's there's often a, it could be a time period is in play for a proposal to be put forward or you know or an agreement there has to be some form of consensus before a multi-sig can be you know the liquidity in multi-sig can be moved or contract is paused so have you ever come across a situation where you where there's potentially a good idea to consider a process for emergencies Yeah, um, you know, DAO structure is pretty bad, as you're pointing out, like the whole system is like so rigid that as to be very vulnerable because of its rigidity. Um, but I have definitely seen DAOs with like, you know, money doesn't get dispersed till at least 24 hours afterwards or something like that. Um, you know, and that there is a stop mechanism on things, but it's very hard to implement. You know, and it's really hard to implement. I mean, I was just talking to somebody right now about their DAO and they said, listen, it's a real problem. We issue all the money to a contractor before they start work because we can't guarantee that if we do it by milestones, we have to vote for the milestone again. And we can't guarantee them like the second half of the work. So we can't do milestones and then and so what they decided to do for one of the they had a really big contract they wanted to do it was a couple hundred thousand dollars and they decided to do a multi-sig wallet where the team of the like the core team has this multi-sig wallet of the two hundred thousand dollars instead of sending it to the contractor and then the team three people from the team have to approve it so it's like what the hell is the DAO for now if you're just, you're right. Cause they couldn't, it, it's so clunky. It's not, and nobody wants to say it's a total fail, but really so far it's been a total fail. Like one big treasury where we have these smart contracts that can't be stopped and no human intervention is possible is it sounds really utopian, which is your first hint that it's not going to work. <laughs> I, I find it I find it interesting that uh, Charles um, had to come up with his own um, organization structure called a member based organization MBO. Uh, it was Vitalik who's who's credited for coining um, DAO. So now maybe the buzzword and, and and the warmth of DAOs are fading, and the next hot thing is going to be the yet to be defined member based organization. Um, but who knows what Nirvana is? We're we're slowly inching. We're toward. trying. Yeah, we're inching. It's inching. We're just doing a little in, inching. In Estonia, we are trying to call it Internet Native Organization because no way we can make it autonomous. But we can see that all of them are internet based. I think you know automation has its place. I'm not sure that we found the right place though. Yeah, like takes time, takes specific skills, and not many people who have those skills are available so freely in the decentralized ecosystem. They're usually snatched up quite quickly and offer quite a lot of money in Google or Facebook who have these capabilities to just, oh, you need this integration with this tool? Yeah, I can get you in, in four hours. They cost like $800 per hour. <laughs> And wow. it's expensive to even approach them sometimes. It kind of relates back to the question I had for Grace after what he said, like, doesn't this process of cherry picking always happen? Um, yeah, and maybe it's good, right? I mean, the reputation system is some is some way to identify the cherries in a more automated way. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. well, some well, of the cherries it? decide to volunteer and continue to volunteer and not ask for what they're worth, though. Mr. Look, Floppy, Mr. Yeah. Cran, you know, you guys got to start asking for what you're worth. Yeah. You know, or the or the team decides like people who give the most time get X every month and that's it. The team can do that. 
Yeah. I would he was like allowed to... to do that. Nice. Yeah, and team, I mean, what do we define by team in this ambassador program is uh, a good question, along with many others that you've raised. Um, I'm aware the, of time right now. That's really yeah. late where I am. I'm like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I just want to thank you so much, Grace, for coming and spending the time with us. It's been such, such a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, for me too. You're really a group of lovely people, and I'm always happy to come hang out with you guys. That's great. Cool. I feel okay. like I gotta say it, Grace, real pleasure seeing you. You are just as wise as I remember you from a couple of years <laughs> back. Uh, and I do apologize for not having stayed in touch. Oh, that's okay. That's, uh, you know, we live in a small enough community that we run into each other the next day. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, nice. We will carry on the meeting after Grace has left for the people that want to stay. But uh, thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Right. See you. Thanks, Grace. Have a good night. Right. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. Bye.